And in general, if you're thinking about the Bible, the Bible is a collection of 66 books written over 1,500 years by 40 authors. And the, the last books were written about 2,000 years ago. And we know that. And if, and if you think of what are some major themes, major theme is a promise. There's going to be a promised one who's going to come, and throughout the Old Testament we see um, that promise. A little, little bit more of it is, is given in books as we move along through the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament we have the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So that would be one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at the scriptures people often ask is, how do you see the gospel, or how do you see Jesus in this passage? You know, those are good questions to ask. But unfortunately, they're a little bit subjective. Because, like, we could look at Ruth, the book of Ruth. And I may say, Boaz is the Christ figure. And someone else may say, no, Ruth is the Christ figure. And someone else may say, Naomi is the Christ figure. And so we could could disagree on that. Someone could say Naomi is because she saves Ruth and brings her into the community. And so she is the one that, that reached out and... And, and saved Ruth, if you will. Um, but what we want to look at today is how do we look at a text and, and come away with, with an accurate meaning of that text? And I hope that that will serve you well throughout the rest of your life as you think about cracking open the scripture and you're reading in, in Galatians and you're saying, okay, what does Paul mean here? Or, or you're reading in Romans and he talks about that um, that righteousness was imputed to Abraham. Well, how, how do you know what that means? How do you figure that out? Or you come to a passage that's really hard, like let's say Hebrews chapter six, verse four. And how do you, you know, at least put parameters on that to say it can either mean this, this, or this, but it can't mean a thousand things. It can only mean a few things. And so we're going to try to look at a couple of those principles today, and and maybe it'll be helpful. So to begin with, as we think about the Scripture, the Scripture is made up of lots of different types of literature. And so there on your sheet, you see some of the different types of literature. It has historical narrative. What would be an example of historical narrative in the Bible? What, What book has a lot of historical narrative? Okay, the book of Ruth, yeah, has a lot of historical narrative. Uh, Genesis, the beginning of Exodus, lots of historical narrative. Acts, again, it's historical narrative. Okay, how about another type of literature that we see is prophecy. Can you think of some books that have a lot of prophecy in them? Isaiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Now, Daniel is historical narrative, and there's prophecy mixed in. Often you will find that prophecy is mixed in within the book. But it's a certain type of genre. In a genre, just like in music, there's different types of genre, right? There's classical, there's rock, there's pop, there's Bollywood, right? Every Bollywood film has at least how many, how many songs in it? At least five songs. Yes, every Bollywood film has at least, they're all musicals, they have at least five songs. You know, and and so there's lots of different genre in music. So there is in literature. We have the Proverbs. Now, the interesting thing about Proverbs is, is Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings that these things, if acted upon, are true in general. But what a lot of people want to do when they come to the Proverbs is take each individual proverb as a personal promise from God that that is going to be true for your life. And I think that's a mistake in the way to look at the Proverbs. I think in general, when you look at the Proverbs, these principles are true in general. And if you apply them in general, this is what will happen. And so we need to be careful as we look at the Proverbs, because sometimes you'll buy like that Bible promise book. You know, you'll sometimes see it like at the choice book rack in a store or, or maybe at a Christian bookstore, and it'll have 101 Bible promises. And they'll have all these Proverbs that'll be listed in there, and they'll be listing them as Bible promises. I don't know that all the promises listed in that book are actually uh, promises if they're coming out of Proverbs. Proverbs was written by Solomon, 
and he collected wise sayings. And if we follow them, you know, in general, it's true. Like he talks about, you know, don't correct a fool because he'll strike you. You know, a word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold in a setting of silver. Well, that's true. Okay, the next one is the songs. Can anyone think of any books that are, are songs? What's that? Yeah, the Psalms. The Psalms are a collection of, of uh, poems or songs to be sung. And then there's instruction, instruction literature. So each one of these you could say historical literature, prophecy literature, proverbs literature, songs literature, instruction literature. Where would we find instruction? Okay, yeah, the Ten Commandments, right? So we find instruction there. Where do we find instruction in the New Testament? Which books are primarily books of instruction? Yeah, Paul's, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. He's writing to these various churches because he either hasn't been there and he wants to introduce himself and impart some knowledge to them, or he's writing because they have a problem. Galatians, what's their problem in Galatians? Well, the gospel, yes, Jesus died for your sins and paid for your sins, but we also have to add some sort of Hebrew tradition to it. You know, whether it be circumcision or going to the temple, we don't know exactly what it was, but they needed to add something to it to authenticate um, uh, the gospel, to show that it's true. So it was the gospel and some other things, and Paul's writing to correct, to correct them. The church in Colossae, he's writing to to inform them that Jesus really is God and he's really human because there's some heresy going on. And so in each one of the books that Paul writes, they're really written as books of instruction. And then apocalyptic. Have any of you seen the the movie Apocalypse Now? Okay. Um, So apocalyptic literature deals with the end of the world. And so where do we see apocalyptic literature in the Bible? There's two places, primarily. What's that? Yeah, Daniel and Revelation. We see a little bit, I guess, I would say, maybe in uh, Ecclesi- um, in Ezekiel. We see a little bit of apocalyptic literature, but it's dealing with the end of the world. How is the world going to end? And so these are, these, these are genres that are given us. And what's interesting, in apocalyptic literature, it's usually given in, um, in these magnificent pictures like if you were an illustrator, I mean, reading Revelation just gives you all kinds of opportunity to um, d- develop like a cover of a, of a, of a magazine or, or the cover of a book or, or if you wanted to create a movie off of it. Um, and then another type of literature that we see is parables. And who is the primary giver of parables? Yeah, Jesus. He told wonderful parables. And parables are given to primarily illustrate one point. If you go beyond the one point, you probably miss the point of the parable. So if you think of that in parables, sometimes what people want to do is they want to come up with 12 meanings for the parable. But the parable is really meant to illustrate one point. And so as you read, say, what is the main point here? What is the big point? So general principles of interpretation of a passage. In general, we want to try to understand what the author is saying and then what is meant by what is said. We are looking to understand the passage as if we would have been there reading it in the first century. Or, not just the first century, that would be the New Testament, but in the case of the law, the first five books, you're looking at about B.C. 2000. And so if we had been the readers back then, How would we have understood the passage is what we want to know. The author has a reason for writing the book and the portions of the book. Our goal is to understand what the author is communicating to those who would have read the book. In light of this, we want to look at the following six questions and ask them of the the passage. So the first question, what is the author's main point of the book? And we can also include within that the who. There is a handout in the back on the chair. You might want to grab that. You'll need that as we move along. What is the author's main point of the book? And we can also include who wrote it, who are they writing it to, when was it written, 
And then the why is really the, the idea that we're looking for. What does that mean point? So let's, let's start with an easy one. The book of John. There's a little trick in reading a book. So let's say you're in John, I don't know, let's say John chapter 17, and you want to understand what's the meaning of John 17. Or when Jesus is talking about abide in me and I in you, um, and, and he's referring to staying attached to the, to the, to the vine, your branch, and you're in John, and so you're trying to figure it out, and then, you're, then it dawns on you. I don't even know what the purpose of John is. Maybe it would be wise to know what the purpose of this book is before I try to figure out what the passage is trying to say. So often in a book, I won't say every single book, but often in the beginning of the book, the author is going to tell you why they are writing the book. So in the beginning of John, it says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being. By Him and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, we don't know who the He is, but if you had to just come up with the meaning of the book of John from this passage, what would you think the meaning of the, of the book of John is just from this passage? Okay, yeah, Jesus Christ being God. So the book of John, and in 117, we're, we're, we're told who the he is. Um, that, that is Jesus Christ. And, and so, as you move through the book of John, you're going to see over and over again that the author is trying to prove to you that Jesus is God. So then when you come to a passage like staying attached to the vine, and the only way you can produce fruit is by staying attached to, uh, staying attached to Jesus, is it not logical that you can produce fruit in your life because you're attached or you're, or you're following God's plan? And if you don't follow God's plan, how can you produce, any last, how can you pr produce fruit for the kingdom of God if you're not connected to God himself? And so let's take another book, the book of Hebrews. What's the purpose of the book of Hebrews? So if you go to the beginning of the book, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his, of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. What's going to be the purpose of this book, do you think? How, how God chose to show himself to man. Okay. In, in a person. In a person, in Jesus. As his son. Okay. And in particular, it's verse 4, that, he, that he's better than the angels. And so the, the whole book of Hebrews, he's going to start with he's better with the angels, and then he's going he's to move to that he's better than, than the law, he's better than the priest, um, he's better than the sacrifices. He is the best. And so throughout the whole book, you're going to see that again, over and over again, it's proving that Jesus is the best in whatever he's being compared to. And so knowing that little piece really helps you. We'll look at two more books real quick. So if you go to Revelation, in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, it gives you some clues in the book. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservant the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by the angel to his bondservant, John. 
So these things that are, will shortly take place. But the thing here that's interesting is in this translation, they, do a, they don't do a great job of, of translating a particular word. It says, he sent and communicated it by his angels to his bondservant, John. So there's a couple tools I want to point out to you. One is this book. It's called Strong's Concordance. But the good news is you don't need to buy this book. You don't need to buy this. You can go to Blue Letter Bible online and it will, it will provide the meaning for the words. So here in this passage, we have... It was communicated in verse 1, but actually this word communicated means that will be given in signs. So this message is going to be given in signs. And so this word is actually only used. And so you could look it up in the Strong's Concordance. And so what Strong's does is it gives every number in the Bible a number. I mean, every word in the Bible, it gives it a number. And so this one is 4591. So if you look up this word 4591, which is the word that's being used for communicated, you will see that it's only used six times in the New Testament. And that word, when it's used other times, like Jesus is talking, and he says, and this, will be a, and this will be a sign to you, I will be raised up. I will be lifted up. And so, in several places, um, so like in, in John 12, 33, he said, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. In John 18, 32, this was fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Um, and then there's a couple passages that deal with someone has written something. In other words, they've, they've, they've provided a written copy, a signature of a story. And so we would know from this that, okay, when it's talking about communication, one of the ways um, that God communicates is through signs and symbols. And so when you enter into Revelation, you see that it's signs and symbols, which would then imply that it's not necessarily to be taken literally. And so we can see early in a book, it can give us clues as to what we'll find later on. For example, if you go to Genesis, what's interesting in, in the first chapter of Genesis is you don't see the personal name of God anywhere in the beginning of Genesis, in the first chapter. You see the word Elohim, which means the great God, creator of the universe. And so when you read God in chapter 1, it's the great creator God of the universe. So in the beginning, the great creator God of the universe created the heavens and the earth. And so every time you read God, think of how many times God is in that first chapter. And so the Israelites, think of where they were for 400 years. They're in Egypt, localized gods. You know, they're in slavery. How powerful is their God? They don't know. They have questions. And so chapter 1, you just have this general word for God. But then in chapter 2, verse 4, then you have Elohim, Yahweh. The great creator God of the universe is who? It's Yahweh. And Yahweh speaks and has a relationship and makes connections. And so throughout the book of Genesis, on into Exodus, you see that God is a personal God and that Yahweh is the God that's in, in charge of everything and can control everything. And that is a big, huge picture that you see in the first chapter, or the first chapter in the first four ver verses of Genesis. So the first chapter of a, book, of a book usually gives you the meaning of the book. Not always, but usually. Okay, what is the surrounding... Uh, where, where do you find the who, when, why? This is a book that I would highly recommend. If you do not have this book, if you were going to purchase one book for the study of the scripture, this would be the book I would recommend. New Bible Dictionary by Ivy Press. This, is, this one's old, used. You can probably get them for a dollar or two on Amazon. New, they're probably under $20. And I would buy the paper copy, and I'd have it on a shelf. And you want to know... You know, what does magic and sorcery, what's, how is magic and sorcery used in the Bible? I'll just turn the page and look at another one. 
What is the Pentateuch? Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. How is it put together? What are the, you know, what are the views on it? What do people view as the problems in the text? Um, what is the, the phrase, the servant of the Lord? You'll see the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Is the day of the Lord good or is it bad? The day of the Lord is a day of wrath. It's not a happy day. It's a day of wrath over and over in Scripture. And so this book will help you understand what those phrases in, in difficult passages, um, uh, difficult sayings mean. Often if you have a, uh, a Bible that has um, any commentary uh, or any notes, they'll often give you uh, when it was written, where was the author when he was writing it, who was the author. Um, so those are the big things. Number two, surrounding context of a passage. So I mentioned Hebrews 6.4 because it's a very difficult passage. But if you read Hebrews, if you begin in about Hebrews 4 and you read through Hebrews 7, it helps interpret that section of the passage that's more difficult. And, and often what people want to do, if you run into like someone in a cult, they'll point to one verse and they'll say, what does that verse say? See that? That verse says that you have to, who knows? Who knows what verse they've chosen? That you have to do something in order to be saved other than believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You have to do something. You have to share your faith. You have to um, be baptized. You have to, whatever it might be, you have to do something in order to, to gain God's favor. So number three, where has the author written on this topic in another passage or book? So like, for example, in, uh, in Romans 3, like around 21... Uh, 321 says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or shown, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, what are the law and the prophets? Old Testament yeah, it, it's all of the, the body of the Old Testament. Again, it's a phrase, and you would be able to go here. You'd be able to go to this book, Law and the Prophets, and it would tell you what that phrase means. The Law and the Prophets means the whole Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So the righteousness of God is through the faith of Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. So we see the righteousness of God. Well, how does Paul use the righteousness of God somewhere else? Well, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, I believe it's the last verse in chapter 5. Starting 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God, in him. And so this sheds light on what does this phrase mean? That we have the, the righteousness of God is upon us. Well, here it tells us more of what the righteousness of God toward us and upon us means. And you can look up righteousness of God um, in, in letters that Paul has written, and you can, you can find more of what it means. So... Um, how does the author use words in this passage and other locations within the book or other books? We kind of looked at that. How are the ideas, concepts, or words used in similar books by other authors? So how does Peter write about the righteousness of God? Do we see it, um, do we see it in any of John's writings? Do we, do we see it talked about in the Gospels? Number six. How are the ideas, concepts, or words used in other parts of the Bible that don't seem to be addressing the same issue? Sometimes that can shed light on the meaning of a word because the word isn't used a lot. And so you have to go to a passage of Scripture that's not really dealing with that topic. 
In other words, let's say I'm dealing with a topic that's dealing with marriage, and it uses a word about binding someone together, but it's the only place that that word is used. And then I have to go to a passage that talks about binding of two animals together. That, and that's a place that the word is used. Well, it will shed insight, but it's not going to carry as much weight as if I had found another passage that dealt with the exact same topic. Does that make sense? Because again, what we're trying to get to is we're trying to say, what was the author trying to communicate? And so the binding together, like for example, we see the passage, do not be unequally yoked. Right? Don't be unequally yoked together. And so what, what is the author talking about there? He's talking about individuals who are believers entering into binding agreements with unbelievers. And he's saying, don't do it. Don't enter into a binding agreement with an unbeliever. And he uses the example of two oxen being um, put inside of the wood collar to pull a cart or to pull a plow. That's what a yoke is. So it's to be a yoke of oxen. And he's saying, don't be bound together. And so someone said, well, is that really what he's talking about? Well, go and read the context. Read the chapter before, read the chapter after, figure it out for yourself. He uses at least three examples that are, that are black and white kind of examples. So I think it's pretty inescapable. Lastly, uh, consult commentaries and Bible dictionaries. Notice I put them last. Often what people want to do is they want to go there first. For color, I really like Barclay. And what do I mean by color? Uh, color is an example, like if you go to Romans, but in Romans 5 what you see is, is Paul uses this idea of, of uh, uh, the one and the many. So Christ died for the one, and he died for the many. The transgression was to all, um, and, and it, pa it passed to... Um, well, anyhow, as you read the passage, it just talks about one and many. And for a number of years, I struggled with that passage. What did it, what did the, what's the many and what's the one? Is this referring to God, Jesus only dying for a few? Is this referring to only a few have sins? What's the one and what's the many? It is in Romans 5.15. So you want to read Romans 5.15 and 16? Just, just the one and the many is all I need. Just but one time. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Okay, abounded for the many. So Jesus' gift is only for the many. It's not for all. Prior to that, it says it's for all. And so, I was a little confused. So I, I pulled out my Barclay commentary, and, and I, I looked at the passage. And so, here's the key to that passage. Do you know what an idiom is? What's an idiom? Yeah, like if I say that's cool, what do I mean? Do I mean it's cold? No, I mean it's nice, right? It means I like that. And so the word for many is actually an idiom. And what it means is the masses. And so if, if you now read the, the passage and put in the masses instead of the many. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the masses die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the masses. The masses. And so what, the, what that word, is, it's an idiom in the Greek, and it means the masses. And when it talks about all, it's referring actually, if you go back in the book of Romans, when he refers to all, he's referring to all types of nationalities. And then when he says the many, he's referring to the masses. And so there was this idea at that time that God's favor is only upon the rich. It's not upon the poor. It's not upon the sick. And so by saying the all and the masses, Jesus is including all nationalities and he's including everyone within those nationalities. The lame, the sick, the president, the beggar on the street. 
and everyone in between. And so Barclay is a great little commentary series. You, you can probably buy the whole collection of Barclay used for probably, I don't know, under $30. And they're just little, they're just little books. Um, I, I really like them for color. And what I mean by color is just understanding those little nuances in a passage. All right. So application. What truth is here that I have not understood? So as you read a passage and, you, and something is new to you, what is the new thing that you now understand? Or maybe even write out, what is the thing I don't understand? The second application is, is there a command I need to follow? So the scripture is not just, it's not a novel. It's not like, wow, that was a neat story. This is life. This is an instruction manual for life. So I mentioned, do not be unequally yoked. That's not like, here's a suggestion, do not be unequally yoked. That was a command, do not be unequally yoked. And I remember my life, I was dating a non-believer, and finally I said, I am never going to date a non-believer again because I want to marry someone who loves Jesus because I do not want to be unequally yoked. And then thirdly, is the Holy Spirit speaking to me in regards to an action I need to take? And you'll notice I have a little uh, note on meaning. After having investigated the above questions, we want to arrive at a meaning. As we arrive at a meaning, we should check to see if the meaning we have arrived at is in line with theologians' views. If not, we can be confident um, we have gotten it wrong. On any given passage, there are typically only several, several reasonable interpretations, and only a few or, or one good one. If our interpretation is novel, meaning one that no one has ever thought of, we can be confident that we probably have it wrong. So here's my points under meaning. Um, yeah, what theology is being expressed? Uh, how is Christ or the gospel shown in the passage? You know, that's because Christ is revealed. The story of Christ is revealed over and over and over again. It's foreshadowed. You know, so I mentioned Ruth. Well, Boaz is definitely a Christ-like figure. But so is Ruth. And so it causes you to think about Christ. You know, in, in David and Goliath, who is the Christ-like figure there? Yeah, I don't know if there's always the right answer, but it forces you to think about who is the hero? Because in the gospel, Christ is the hero. And so who is the hero of the story? And how are they like Christ? How are they different than Christ? How did they act like Christ? How did they not act like Christ? And then five, discuss difficult passages with knowledgeable, mature believers. I think one of the greatest tricks that cults and very legalistic uh, churches have is secret knowledge. You're acquiring some kind of secret knowledge. And that is not what the body of Christ is for. The body of Christ has been given us to help keep us from error. So, under, under final thoughts, um, well, let me just go back to application. I have one where I have written under application. Uh, is this is when we want to see how the passage applies to our life. And so this, this next sentence is really important. The Holy Spirit can take any passage and use it to address any area of our life. God is unbound by, you know, he's not bound by, well, the scripture's only addressing, um, I don't know, it, it's only addressing some Old Testament law. Now, God can use that scripture to do whatever he wants in your life. For example, my wife's mother came to Christ by reading Exodus. She was in a Bible study about Exodus, and she saw the goodness and the majesty of God in Exodus, and she came to faith. Well, Exodus is not where I would do an investigative Bible study. So the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. Um, 
So again, the Holy Spirit can take any passage and use it to address any area of life. But our goal in this exercise is to not be the Holy Spirit, but to look at the meaning and ask, what truth is there that I have to understand? Or what truth is here that I have not understood? Is there a command I need to follow? And then lastly, is the Holy Spirit speaking to me in regards to taking action? And then final thoughts. Share your interpretation and application with others. Ask for their opinion and and critique of your conclusion. God has given us the body of Christ to protect us against error. I know in my life there was a time where I was studying some things through a guy that was a little bit out there. And the person that was... Um, that I was talking with, he's like, oh, don't discuss that with them. They wouldn't understand. You know, and so it's a subtle cult trick to not discuss something with other people. And as I began to bring things to light and ask people questions, they're like, I don't know if I agree with that. Have you looked at this? Have you thought about that? And it was suddenly, instead of looking at a sliver of scripture, which is what this legalistic person wanted me to do, I began to look at the great breadth of Scripture and see that, yes, there might be some truth in what he's saying, but the way he's applying it and, and the magnitude of the truth that he's presenting is, much lim- is very limited because the breadth of Scripture is speaking to that. So, anyhow, our 45 minutes is done. 3.45 is when I needed to be done. Any questions? I know I didn't cover everything. And, and, there, and some of you may be sitting here and saying, okay, that didn't really help me as much as I thought. Or maybe you're thinking, well, that was great. But anyhow, any questions about um, what, I'm, what I'm communicating, what, what I'm trying to say? The one that I thought of, which they may have, and I may be wrong, is you would be able to tell us where in another passage of Scripture we could compare mm-hmm. a word how would they know if they're just, how would we know if we're just beginning to read? Yeah. How do you know how to compare scripture with scripture? So let's say you're in a passage and you're, and you're like, okay, the meaning of this, yeah, so the question is, how do you know where to go to compare the passage of scripture? Because unfortunately, what, what the English Bible does is there may be five or seven or ten words that are used in the Greek but the English translate as one word. Like the passage we looked at in Revelation, communicate. Well, there's a number of words that can be used for communicate. And so you don't know what word is used. But you can go to this book, and what's nice about this book is you go, now this particular one is, uh, is a concordance of the King James, but you could get a concordance of the ESV or the NIV. And then you would go and you would look up that word in the NIV and then you would go down to the passage that that word is in. And then it will give you a number for that word. And then you go to the back and it will tell you everywhere that it's at. Or, if you want an easier way to do it, you go to Blue Letter Bible, you type in the passage, you hold on the word that you're interested in, and it will pull up all the other places that that word and it will give you the Strong's number. It will give you the definition. It will give you the first, second, third definition. It will tell you every word that that word is used in the New Testament or every word that that word is used in the Old Testament. So you'll know which word you're dealing with because the translator uh, made a choice for you. Another thing you can do is you can, you can take other translations. Like the King James is an old translation, But the thing about the King James is it was written at a time where the English language was fuller. And so when you go to that word in the King James, it says signify. Because that was a word that they would have used back then. Or today we don't use that. And another passage is talking about different types of sin and it uses the word concupiscence. Well, I don't even know what concupiscence means. But... It, it, it's dealing with a very specific word in the Greek. And so by, if you have the King James and you're looking and it, and it doesn't read the same way, like there's a word in there that's translated different, it can be a, a simple clue for you to say, oh, okay, there, there's a different word in underlying um, uh, Greek or Hebrew 
that maybe I can look at. Um, the King James will also give you, it will tell you if it's dealing with a plural or a singular you. In the New Testament, the Greek has a plural you and a singular you. So the NASB, which is the translation I was reading from, um, uses that. Uh, the King James uses it. I think the New King James uses it. And so where you see the, it's singular, and when you see ye, it's plural. Now, if we had a Southern Bible, we wouldn't have that problem. We'd have you and y'all. But we don't, in proper English, have y'all. Um, so, But Blue Letter Bible, online, fool around with it, figure out how to make it, make it work. It's very helpful. It'll give you the Greek word. It'll translate the Greek word um, in, into a readable English. It will tell you where the other words are used give you definitions of the word. Very, very helpful. Any other questions before we end? I would say begin. Pick a passage and begin. And just work your way through it slowly. Pick a verse. You can go to John 1. What does the word word mean? Does it mean a word? Like a spelling word? Or does it mean something more? Is it like an English word? What does it mean? Well, what you'll find is that the word word actually means logos. And the word has tons of meaning behind it. And so you can go to this book. So you would, you would go to Blue Water Bible and you'd find out, oh, it's really logos. And then you can go here and you can look up word. And you can read word and it'll tell you all about the logos. It'll have page after page about the logos in it. And you can read about what is the logos. How did the Greeks understand this idea of Logos? Yeah. Uh, when could we read the Revelation, the last chapter? Uh, I mean, some vision inside it is difficult to understand, like yeah. different color kind of forms, red forms, yeah. white forms, black forms. Yeah. Could you give me some recommendation? You mean when to read it? Yeah. Well, well is which level we should it? Okay. That's a question. Uh, the question was, when should you read Revelation and what level should you yeah. read Revelation at? Well, Revelation tells you that you're blessed if you, if you hear the reading of Revelation. So the scripture itself tells you that you will be blessed if you hear it read. And so I would not tell you to put off reading Revelation because God tells you that you'll be blessed by reading it. So when we look at Revelation, we saw that in the very beginning of Revelation that it's given in signs, that it's signified or, um, yeah, given, given to us in signs and symbols. So if it's given to us in signs and symbols, we shouldn't necessarily expect to understand all of the signs and symbols. And so one of the ways to interpret what it's saying is looking at how has a word been used previously in the Bible. You know, like when it talks about the stars and the moon falling. Well, we see in Genesis, we see in Genesis that the stars and the moon are referred to in the dream that Joseph had as his family. So as the Jewish family. So many people want to say, well, the stars and moon they're the, they're the stars and moon, and they're going to fall, and everything's going to be destroyed. But the way stars and moon are used, at least the way I understand it in the Scripture, is going all the way back to Joseph's family. And we see that his parents are going to be bowing down to him. The sun and the moon will be bowing down to him, and his brothers, I think, are the stars in the passage. And so the previous text gives us understanding. Does that make sense? No, meaning when you come across difficult words that you, that you don't go outside the Bible to try to find out what the meanings of those words are. That the Bible has often, I shouldn't say you never go outside, but the Bible has often provided definitions and uses of those words in previous books of the Bible that can shed light. But I would say in general when you read Revelation, 
that you're seeing the majesty and the greatness of God. And I don't think that you're going to be able to figure everything out in Revelation. But Christ is coming back. And he's going to come back powerful and in majesty and in glory. And the purpose of Revelation, when it says that you'll be blessed if you hear it, the reading of it, is so that you will view your life in light of Christ is coming back. And it's going to be apocalyptic. It's going to be terrible when he comes back. In other words, there's going to be destruction. And to be ready is the idea. Will you be ready? Will your life be put in order? And many, Jesus gives us many images of that. He tells of the twelve, the seven bridegrooms, or the, the, seven brides, the seven bridesmaids who have their lamps and they run out of oil. You know, they weren't ready. And so Revelation is a whole book about to warn you to be ready for the coming of the king and the destruction of the day of the Lord. So I think I need to end for sake of time. So this is just the beginning of studying the Bible. Grab a book on how to study the Bible. I encourage you to do that. New Bible Dictionary. Ivy Press. Buy the book. Go to Amazon. Order it today. It'll be there when you get home. This this will be one of the most valuable books you can have if you're you're ever going to teach the Bible or you're ever going to dig in. You know, you want to know more about what the Bible says. And you want to find something out on your own. Thank you very much. Blessings upon you.